come back, both who are frequent to the attendees before this committee, witnesses before the committee. So you want to start, Karen, or Mr. Buckley? Yes, Madam Chair, I will start. And I think we will divide it up. Hopefully Michael got my email respecting our presentations here today. We are both here as members of the Common Interest Communities Subcommittee of the State Bar of Nevada. And the individual members of that committee I will list for you so you will know who they are besides Michael and myself. They include Avise Higbee, Gail Kern, Elisa Lavelle, John Leach, Doug Malin, Renee Ruther, Mandy Shabinsky, Joan Wright, and William Wright. And all of us are real estate law practitioners, and I believe it's a group that is representative of all of the stakeholders in this act, NRS 116. We represent developers, builders, HOAs, and managers. And even though we come from different points of view, we adhere to our mission statement, which is in the bylaws of our real property section, which I would like to share with you, because it's important to how we approached the Uniform Act and the provisions we included in this bill. Our bylaws state that the section's proposed legislation or position on legislation must relate closely and directly to the administration of justice. It must involve matters which are not primarily political and as to which evaluation by lawyers would have particular relevance if not related closely and directly to the administration of justice. And finally, it must be legislation which comes within the section's special expertise and jurisdiction. So for this reason, when our subcommittee reviewed the Ukiah revisions that were made, as Allison pointed out, both in 1994 and 2008, we did not include every single revision in the bill, simply because some we believed were political or controversial. So we have brought forth provisions which we believe are not political in this bill. And if you recall, last session, this legislature did adopt several Uniform Act revisions that were either in the 1994 Uniform Act or the 2008 Uniform Act, and those had to do basically with commercial projects. They had to do with cost-sharing agreements and a definition of common interest communities. This bill is a little longer than our bill was last session, and it seems daunting at first because it is 61 sections, but many of the sections are either moving things around so that they can be found. A lot of these provisions were stuck in sections which, you know, if you're looking for a section, you can't find it, and others are simply wordsmithing, stylistic changes, and technical changes. So I will point those out as we go along. You might wonder what the value of a Uniform Act is, and as a practitioner, I can speak to that. Basically, when you have a Uniform Act, we don't always have a lot of case law in Nevada to help us interpret laws. And what a Uniform Act does is it allows us to go to the official comments of the Act and to look at case law from other jurisdictions which have adopted the same Uniform Act. And granted, our Act is not uniform. We've made a lot of changes to it, but there are provisions which run through all of the Uniform Acts which we can look to. So I think that's the value of conforming our law to the extent we can to uniform provisions. So I will start with Section 2 of the Act. It's found on page 3 of the bill. And I'll go through Section 38, and then I believe, Michael, are you going to be covering Sections 39 through the rest of the bill? Hopefully that will be the way we divide it up this morning. 
so anyway, Section 2 is sort of a, what it is, it's a universal notice provision, which, which kind of fills in the holes. If there's no other provision in law which requires uh, a certain method of giving notice, this section says this is the way you must give notice to owners in a homeowners association. And the first method is to either mail or email to the address that the owner designates. If the owner has not designated an address, then you can hand deliver to the unit's owner. You can uh, hand, you can either hand deliver or mail or overnight delivery to the mailing address of the of the unit. Um, and third, if the unit owner has not maybe designated an email address but has given you an email address, you can use that email address. And the fourth way of giving the alternative notice is a new method and it just says any other method reasonably calculated to provide notice to the unit's owner and those that come to mind might be uh, posting on the association uh, billboard if there's like a, a not a billboard but a notice board a, a bulletin board uh, that the association has that may be an, an alternative method of notice. Subsection 2 uh, makes clear that if a good faith effort is made to give notice to uh, by these authorized means to a unit owner, um, it's, it's not going to invalidate any action taken uh, without a meeting or at a meeting for lack of, of, for someone coming forth and saying they didn't get notice. This act makes clear in subsection 3 that foreclosure notices are not included in this notice method, NRS 116.3116 to 116.3116.8 are the foreclosure provisions. So foreclosures have to be given in accordance with the foreclosure provision. The other uh, exception is if there is a specific notice provision in the chapter, then notice must be given in accordance with that notice provision. Uh, section 3 is the next section, and basically this just says that our statute supersedes any contrary uh, provisions in federal law in the Federal Electronic Signatures in Global and National Commerce uh, Act. So this is not a new provision to Nevada's uh, uh, statutory law. NRS 107A also contains this very same language. The next section, which is a substantive section, is Section 4. And this basically deals with, in fact, the this is a new section in the Uniform Act, and it is entitled in the Uniform Act, Termination Following Catastrophes. So this, this section uh, involves termination in, in very extreme situations. And basically, the, the two elements of the uh, of the um, applicability of this law are that there be uh, that there be a um, a catastrophe which or, or a disaster of some sort, a destruction which destroys substantially all of the units, and normal means of um, notifying owners are not available. So obviously, with email and other means other than delivery to the unit um, available for notice, this would have to be an extreme situation. And basically, Section 4 provides that the executive board or any interested person may bring an action in district court to terminate the common interest community. And a court is given the latitude to terminate or reduce the size of the community. Um, the city of Henderson has contacted me and has expressed concern that a court could force the city to form a maintenance district if the community were sitting there as a blight, wasn't sold as a whole to some third party because of economic conditions. And I have looked at the comments, the official comments to the Uniform Act, and, and I don't find that, that this is um, in there or possibly even would be possible because you've got parties to the action being the unit's owners themselves. Um, so um, third parties would have to be brought in separately. And 
certainly I, I would like to say that this is not our intent in bringing this forward that a city would have to come forward and and um, establish a maintenance district or otherwise be burdened with the with the cost of, of the uh, of the blight or the problem next uh, section 5 of the bill this is not a change in the law, but it merely um, moves existing law to a new separate section. This is moved from NRS 116.31036 sub 3. Same goes for section 6 of the bill. This deals with official publications of the association. This is already in the law. It's simply moved from another section. Section 7 is an important um, an important change. Uh, right now, you could read the existing law to say that you can change the staff, statutory definitions uh, in this chapter through the declaration, you know, through uh, defined terms in the declaration or the bylaws of the association. And this law makes clear that, as used in this chapter, um, the words and terms defined in this chapter shall have the meaning set forth in the law, not in, in a declaration. Or, or the bylaws. Uh, sections 8 and 9 are simply grammatical changes. Um, section 10 is a substantive section that's found on page 6 of the bill. And basically, it recognizes that common elements can include property interests which are outside the platted subdivision of the bill. Uh, subdivision of the of the common interest community. Uh, for example, there can be easements outside the subdivision or other interests which one benefit the owners of the association and two are subject to the declaration. So those are the two requirements which are required to bring those real property interests within the definition of common elements. Uh, section 11 is just a uh, grammatical correction and, and a conforming correction. Uh, the conforming correction recognizes that a declarant can be a person or group of persons, which is in the lead in language says declarant means any person or group of persons. So it's just a conforming change in, in subsection 1. Section 12, um, this is a, uh, a correction which recognizes that the executive board is often not designated in the declaration, but it's actually designated in the bylaws. So this adds the term bylaws to section 12. Then we go uh, sections 13, 14, 15, 16. Those are all basically grammatical or stylistic changes. Section 17, which is on page 7, is simply a conforming change to include um, another to, to recognize that there's an exception in another provision of the law. Section 18. This law, uh, it, this just adds to existing law. Existing law basically says that you not only look to 116 when you're interpreting 116, but you look to other laws. Um, you know, the entire body of law that, that, that could affect real property and or, or associations. And um, the law of corporations is listed as one of them. This addition to the, to the statute would simply say that any other form of organization, such as an LLC, uh, would also, uh, you would also look to LLC law in construing this law. Um, section 19 is not a Substantive change, this is language which was duplicated in another section. It's contained right in, already in NRS 116.4117 sub 1. Uh, section 20 clarifies uh, which provisions of the R Act would apply to a subdivision that's located outside of state, and these sections relate to the delivery of a public offering statement. The public offering statement, as you know, is the disclosure document that's given to prospective purchasers. And I believe there should be a technical correction to this, which I'd like um, 
LCB maybe to look into, I believe is section 116.41035 has been omitted. It's not a section that's in the Uniform Act, at least under that numbering sequence. So I think that it's in our act, and I think it should be added to that. We can look at that later. Okay. Section 21. Yes. Is that section 20? Yes. Could you tell us where specifically? I would insert it before NRS 4104 because it deals with communities of 12 lots or less, and to the extent applicable, that modifying phrase would be appropriate. So I would say, and to the extent applicable, NRS 116.41035, and then go on with NRS 116.41004. Thank you. Section 21 is an LCB conforming change, and then going over 22, 23, 24. I told you this would be fast. 25, 26, and 27. These are all, so 21 through 27 are either technical or conforming changes, not substantive changes. So we're turning pages here over to page 16. Section 28 of the bill. This pertains to further subdivision of units, and by units, the term units is used to mean, it can mean subdivision lots. So you could also have a, you know, more commonly you'd have a large lot that was further subdivided, and it provides for the reallocation of the allocated interest being how assessments are allocated, how votes are allocated. And basically, this change to this particular section in the law just recognizes that, and it's consistent with the allocation section, that the further subdivision you can reallocate on any basis for allocation, which is provided for in the declaration of CC&R. So that just recognizes what is in existing law in this section. Section 29 basically adds to owner's easements. Right now, the law states that the easements, right now the law simply applies to planned communities, such as single family lot subdivisions, and this change recognizes that owner easements are also important or applicable in condos and co-ops, which are two other forms of ownership which are included in NRS 116. And then subsection 3 clarifies that the owner's use of the common elements does not include limited common elements. Limited common elements are things like patios and balconies, things that are really intended for the use by one particular unit. So the use rights do not extend, of all owners, do not extend to the limited common elements. Section 30 pertains to amendments to declarations. And subsection 2 of section 30 is a uniform act change, which most of these are, if they're not technical corrections. And subsection 2 of section 30 basically allows an amendment by a different percentage other than a majority vote if the declaration provides for it. So it could be a higher percentage than a majority or a lower percentage than a majority. Karen, pardon for interrupting. I think you're actually referring to subsection 1 of section 30. Is that correct? Excuse me. Yes. Just right above subsection 2. Thank you very much. It is subsection 1. I had that wrong in my notes. There's another error that I would like to point out here in subsection 4 of section 30. 
the crossed out words affected and the consent of a majority of the owners of the remaining units should be not deleted, but they should be put back in the bill. So again, on section subsection four, the, the crossed out language should not have been removed. Subsection six uh, deals with uh, amendments which restrict uh, the use of the unit uh, or the qualifications of persons who may occupy the unit. Uh, for example, um, if the amendment were to age restrict a community, it would not under this section apply to persons who purchased before the amendment uh, went into effect. And um, that person would, that restriction would not apply to that particular unit until it was sold to some, some other party. So this is a, a protection then from amendments which when you, when you bought your unit, Every, you know, you could have pets or whatever, but now that's restricted to the to no pets or, or different size or whatever type of pets than you brought in. So um, this would be a protection against changes which would affect owners adversely. Uh, section subsection seven of section thirty provides that if there's a provision in the declaration which creates special declarance rights those provisions may not be amended without the declarant's consent. An example of a special declarant's right, for example, would be the right to add additional property to the common interest community. So that would require the declarant's consent to amend. And most CCNRs, um, sophisticated CCNRs, I guess, do do contain these provisions. So this just codifies those those kinds of things which, which make common sense. Um, section Subsection 8 of Section 30 is um, consistent with a concept which was adopted by Fannie Mae some years ago, the concept of an eligible mortgage holder. And it, it basically relates to which lenders are entitled to notice of amendments. And it, um, you know, a lender's non-responsiveness could hold up and, and prevent uh, an amendment to CCNRs. So to be eligible for notice of an amendment to the CCNRs, a lender, a guarantor, or an insurer of a loan must give notice to the association that desires notice of an amendment. And then uh, once notice is given, uh, Section 30 recognizes that an amendment should not be delayed just because the lender fails to respond. So it provides that the lender's consent is not required if refusal to consent is not received within 60 days after delivery of the notice to the lender. Section 31 is next on page 18. And this change really simply incorporates the new uh, termination provisions into um, our existing uh, termination statute so that uh, presumably um, the, the new catastrophic termination statute would be in a separate section in 160, and this just um, makes a conforming change to include that uh, catastrophic method, uh, court action uh, uh, provision in, in um, section four. Um, okay. Section 32 is the next section, and that is simply clarification changes. Um, subsection 3 does provide that an association must have an executive board. I think that's maybe not directly stated in the statute, but everything refers to executive board, so this simply clarifies that the association needs to have a board to conduct its business. And then subsection four simply um, recognizes that there's other forms of organizations besides those listed. Mm -hmm. Okay, section 33. This basically uh, 
prior to <clears throat> prior to um, prior law or existing law makes the first two powers of the association permissive, and this law makes them mandatory. The two things that an association must do is they must adopt the bylaws and they must adopt and amend budgets. Now, with respect to amendment of the bylaws, um, our, our section has added, um, the members of our section who brought this, this forward have added the fact that um, the, the bylaws could provide that um, the amendment powers to the bylaws reside in the owners. So it's only to the extent that the board has the power to amend the bylaws that they shall amend the bylaws. So the other section simply lists the permissive powers of the association. Subsection 3 is an important uh, clarification as to when the board may take action. Uh, many declarations of CCNRs do provide that the, that the board is empowered to enforce the provisions of the declaration, but is not required to enforce the provisions of the declaration. And um, this merely codifies that fact that, um, you know, there's certain, it recognizes there are certain circumstances where it would not be in the best interest of the association to enforce the CCNRs. Uh, enforcement actions are expensive. And the statute pr proposed here would set forth criteria which the board can follow to determine when and when not to take action to enforce the CCNRs. So I think it provides concrete criteria for the board to follow. And if any one of these four elements, which are listed at the top of page 23, is present, then uh, they can determine that uh, no action will be taken. And subsection 4 uh, of section 33 makes clear that failure to enforce any section of the CCNRs is not a waiver by the association that under different circumstances in the future, uh, the enforcement action can be taken so long as their decision to enforce or not enforce is neither arbitrary nor capricious. Section 34 just simply adds officers to the standards of care for, for directors. Uh, it's clear that now officers and directors are required to exercise the ordinary and reasonable care of officers and directors of a nonprofit corporation. So it incorporates the nonprofit corporation statute. And also, they are subject to the business judgment rule. And the addition is that they're also subject to conflict of interest rules uh, governing officers and directors of nonprofit corporations organized under the laws of the state of Nevada. Subsection 2 provides for things which, which an executive board may not do. Um, and the uh, language basically, they, they may not amend the declaration except as otherwise provided in section 116.2117. Um, they may not terminate the common interest community. Um, they may not uh, elect members of the executive board uh, except for the purpose of filling vacancies. So. Uh, this addition here recognizes that a vacancy may be filled uh, by the executive board. And finally, uh, they may not determine the qualifications, powers, duties, or terms of office of members of the executive board. And subsection 3 recognizes, as we've said before, that the ex executive board shall adopt the budget for the association. Section 35 is not new. Um, it's uh, the added language that you see there was taken from NRS 116.3108, subsection 5. Uh, 
Section 36, the language regarding voluntary surrender of declarant control of the board is not new either. It's moved just from a subsection of that same section. Section 37 is not new language. This was moved from NRS 116.3108. And then finally, Section 38, this section was taken from, again, from the Uniform Act. And under current law, an association board can terminate management contracts and other contracts, management or employment contracts, contracts relating to the lease of recreational or parking facilities entered into with the declarant or an affiliate of declarant. And the board, which is elected by the owners, has an unlimited time to terminate these contracts. So they can declare the contracts void without cause, and the time period runs forever. This amendment would place, and again, this was a Uniform Act change, would place a two-year statute of limitations on the ability of the owner control board to terminate contracts with the declarant. The second part of that, though, is that there is no limitation on contracts or leases that were not entered into in good faith or that are unconscionable. If those two elements, either of those two elements exist, then there is no two-year limitation on termination. And with your permission, Madam Chair, I'd like to turn this over to Michael Buckley to take you through the rest of the bill. Any questions thus far, committee? Senator Kopeny? Thank you, Madam Chair. Karen, just going right back to Section 38, you said this is a new uniform law. What was the reasoning behind the two-year statute? Right. And I'm not sure what the reasoning is, but I can only say that, you know, there would be no certainty in contracts if you had an unlimited time after the owner took over the board within which to terminate these contracts. So two years, one would think, would be a reasonable amount of time for an owner control board to get its arms around what it had in front of it. If there was something with a declarant, a contract with a declarant that was not fair or a management contract, maintenance, employment contract, or lease of a recreational or parking facility, any of those things, they should be able within two years, I would think, to determine that they wanted to terminate them. Thank you. Karen, in Section 33, where you're discussing the business judgment rule, which is current law, and selectively enforcing a lot, that's pretty substantial to me, that section, and, you know, the discretion of the board. And like the legislature, we cannot bind a future legislature to make decisions a certain way. What is the practice for an executive board, the nature of earlier decision making, on future decision making, and so on? What standard is used there in terms of their discretion and their decision making practices? Well, I think, I guess the question is, would a board be bound by the prior decisions of a prior board? And I don't know of anything that would bind them to a decision made by a prior board. You know, obviously they have to act within the scope of the CC&R as a declaration and the scope of the law, but beyond that, a decision made by one board could certainly be changed by another board. And for the purposes of, because again, this is about decision making, and again, it's current law, would you explain to the committee what the business judgment rule is in practice? 
Um, Madam Chair, I'm not totally prepared to tell you exactly what the business judgment rule is, but uh, I do know that it gives latitude to a board to exercise good business judgment, um, and um, it, it's, it's fairly liberally interpreted in favor of of the board's decision. Of course. Um, obviously, the board has a fiduciary duty to the owners to act in the best interest of the association and not sure. in their own self-interest or some other interest. Um, and the business judgment rule allows the board within that fiduciary duty to um, to um, to use its best business judgment. Additional questions or comments, committee, before we turn it to Mr. Buckley in the South. Okay, 